a temple. You know, what's the first picture that would come to your mind if you were to think about a temple? I mean, maybe you'd think about some ornate building, some massive, giant, um, fancy building, lot of expense. There's a Buddhist temple down the road, isn't there? And Ulverston's known for that Buddhist temple. When I ask people about Ulverston and I say to them, uh, I come from, I come from, or when I say to people I come from Ulverston, sometimes people say, oh yeah, it's that place with the Buddhist temple. I mean, wouldn't it be great if Ulverston was known for Jesus Christ and not for a Buddhist temple? Wouldn't it be great if, the, if Ulverston was known for, for something that brought, brought God glory, that, that God could um, receive credit for and praise for and hallelujahs for? That would be fantastic. I'd love Ulverston to be known as a Christian town. It's a festival town. There is some talk that we're having amongst the church leaders where they will have a Jesus festival because we've got Buddhist festivals and we've got all kinds of festivals. We've got beer festivals, Buddhist festivals, and all kinds of bee festivals. But we want to have a J festival, the Jesus festival. I'm not sure how we do that, what we'd call it, but you know, we've got one shot. And I've said recently, we've got one shot at this life and we want to make the most of the opportunity. We've got one shot. We want no regrets. You know, we want no regrets when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here right now in this place at this time, in this town or in these, this area at the right place at the right time. And now it's time for us to do whatever it is that God wants us to do, amen? So no regrets. So anyway, when you think of the Buddhist temple, You've got like um, the, the ornate roof, it's got a gold roof and all that kind of thing. And, and I would love Ulverston to have something to, to kind of, I don't want to say match. You know, when you say match it, our God doesn't just match things, does he? Our God like exceeds, uh, exceed, does exceedingly above or beyond anything that we could even imagine. So imagine we're going to build a, a temple to Jesus Christ here. We're not becoming Mormons, but let's just say we were, we were going to build a temple for Jesus Christ here. I mean, imagine what it would look like. It'd have to at least beat that one down there. I don't mean that critically. <laughs> well, I mean it honestly. It would have to beat the one down there because Jesus Christ is the living God, amen, or he embodies the living God. So it'd have to be something pretty magnificent. I don't know if we've got enough gold to, to put on the roof of this place to turn it into uh, a temple. But God has done something. He's done something with all of us. He's done something so amazing that like so many religious leaders of Jesus' time could not understand, could not see. It blew their minds. They couldn't work it out. They couldn't see how God was going to do it, but he's already done something that's way above and beyond any temple like that one down there. Like, like beyond any, what you see as a church building or cathedral. He's already onto it, and it's much more holy, much more magnificent, much more fascinating and beautiful than any other temple anywhere that's ever been created. Some of you, I can tell, you already know where we're going with this. But turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, please. Verse 19 says, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having, be, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in, him, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds amazing to me. And let me just tell you, that word temple there, in verse 21, where it says that where the whole thing grows, it, where, the, where we're all being fitted together to grow into a holy temple, that word temple is neos. Uh, it's from, uh, Strong's defines it as Greek 3485. And just let me read the definition of that word temple. It's used of the temple at Jerusalem, but only of the sacred edifice or the sanctuary itself consisting of the holy place and the holy of holies. In classical Greek, it's used of the sanctuary or the cell of the temple where the image of gold was placed. It's also used as a metaphor, the spiritual temple, consisting of the saints of all ages 
joined together by and in Christ. And what I find amazing about the temple that we are called to be part of, that we are called to be built up in and to be members of, is that it's not just the temple. In, 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 if you're reading through the Bible in English and you find the word temple, you'll see the word temple, but there's two different words that could be used. I don't actually know the other one. Uh, I didn't write it down. I just wrote down naos because that's the most important one for us. But there's also the word temple, which means the temple generally, the whole building, the whole place, the grounds. So if I said we're going down to the Buddhist temple, we might not actually go into the temple, but we've gone to the Buddhist temple. We're in the grounds, we're in the place. We're walking around near Conishead Priory. Where did you go today? Oh, I went down to the Buddhist temple. Uh, that's not something I do regularly, by the way. But you understand what I mean? And, and that would be a different word, temple. It's the area, it's the grounds of the temple, it's the, it's the outskirts. But the temple that God wants to build us up into, the, the temple that God wants us to be part of, the, God, the, the temple that, that God is calling us to, in fact, he's already started the work, is that innermost temple where his spirit dwells, in the holy of holies, in the sanctuary, in that very place where God dwells and is worshipped. That is amazing. That God has already decided that you and I are to be part of his temple. And that's what he's building up. And that's why I say it's going to be, it already is so more amazing, so more fascinating than any human structure. I mean, God somewhere decided, I don't know how he did this, but somewhere decided, like whenever he decided it, he decided that, yeah, I've been in temples and I've dwelt in the sanctuary and there's been strict rules so that I could dwell there and only certain people could go in there. At some point, God decided, I don't want a sanctuary like, I don't want a temple like this. I know where I want to be worshipped, in the hearts of people. And if you want to make it very specific, in the hearts of the people at Emmanuel Christian Centre today, God decided to, be, to build his temple there. That when Jesus died, many of you know this, the veil of the temple was torn in two, and human beings like you and I now have access to the Holy of Holies. Not just, not just to the temple where we can worship God from afar off, right into the very holy place where God dwells. Apparently, and it's, I don't know if it's legend or, or real, but apparently the priests who went into the holy and holiest place of the temple had to have ropes around them just in case they sinned or did something that would offend God because God is so holy, so, so set apart, so amazing, so, so right and, and, and sacred that if they just did any little thing wrong, they could die. But they had a rope to pull them back out. Isn't it amazing that God would choose to say, forget that, now what I'm doing is I'm going to go and live in these people. That is amazing. Lord, where can I go to worship you? Where can I sing about you? Where can I, where can I feel you and sense your presence? Wherever you are at any given time, I'm going to come and live in you. That's going to be the holy place. And I'm going to build you up into a holy temple for my name's sake. Why that should be fascinating and why I feel like that's fascinating is because our lives being built up into the temple of God with the holy presence of God inside us want fitly joined together, I think it says in there somewhere. As Jesus Christ, the, the, the chief cornerstone, being fitted together, the whole building being fitted together, together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Why that's amazing is because that means that what God is doing in our lives and the way we should be living and how we're fitly joined together with one another, doing the thing that we're supposed to do in the temple or as part of the temple, should outshine anything else, any other religious experience, anything else anybody's got to look at. It should be greater than any fascinating building you can see. That's what God wants to do with us. That's amazing. It is to me. <laughs> and man, even Christians or churches, they spent, yeah, let's build something that would honour God. Let's, and this place is fantastic and we're so grateful to God for it. But let the, you know, they come up with plans, let's build something that would honour God. Let's, let's build a place, a house of God. They call churches the house of God. And I can accept that, I understand what they mean. But the real house of God is the people. The real house of God is the people with whom the Spirit dwells. Where the Spirit is in them. Resting, making his abode, living, dwelling. That's awesome. Now I don't know how God does it. Because you have to get your head around some theological points that I just don't have the insight right now to answer. But considering how holy that holy of holies was, I don't know how God did it, 
but he allowed his Holy Spirit to come inside us and then to change us and transform us bit by bit. You'd think we'd have to be perfect before he came and he dwelled there. You'd think we'd have, to, we'd have to be perfect, wouldn't you? You'd think we'd have to be like so right all the time. Any mistake, we've lost it. But the Holy Spirit says, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stick to my task. Now, I believe, as the insight that I have, which is not much, but for as far as I can see, that the reason he stays there is because of the price that our king paid that the Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ, laid down his life and he was so right. He was so perfect. He did nothing wrong. He was so obedient to his father, so righteous, that when he died and he died in the state of living the perfect life in our place, his blood somehow makes the way for you and I to have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. No wonder that when we give our lives to Jesus at the cross, no wonder when we say, Jesus, I give my life to you, and you're at the cross, and you're, you're looking to what Jesus did, no wonder at that moment the Holy Spirit rushes in. Because as soon as you look to what Jesus did, the price has been paid for the Spirit of God, God to dwell in you. That is fascinating. It really is. So when I'm looking out here today, I'm looking with different eyes today because of what the Lord's been showing me. And I'm looking at an amazing temple, a temple of God, an amazing place where he, want, he dwells. That is, if the Spirit of the Lord indeed dwells in you. And he calls us to be fitly joined together. Imagine a temple being built up and how it's going to be built up. It's like, we can't just decide where I, I want to put this part of the temple there. So let me just, just let me hold up there. In the sense of being a temple, each one of us is like a holy place. Each one of us is like a temple for the living God. But we're also being built up into a greater temple. I remember a few years ago, I, I don't know if it was foolishly or immaturely, used the analogy of the Power Rangers, where each one is already powerful. When they all come together, there's like some greater being some greater, I don't know if it's a robot or whatever it is, some superpower ranger. The same sense of being temples, we're all temples of the Holy Spirit if the Spirit of God dwells in us. But he's also building us up into a greater temple, which is in fact his church, the body of Christ. That's amazing. And I, and I look at that in the sense of, people say, well, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian, which kind of has a truth to it. But there is also another truth that we are supposed to be fitly joined together, doing what he wants us to do, how he wants us to do it. And no wonder Paul says, um, because I'm an eye, you know, don't say because you're an eye, you're no good, or because I'm a, a hand, I'm, I can't walk, whatever, you know, whoever you are and whatever you're supposed to be doing, with the spirit of God inside you, you are vital and important to the temple that he is building, a living temple. At Bassenfell, in a Christian center in Keswick that we've been to in the past as a church. Sometimes they'd play games and um, the, the younger ones or the fitter ones, that would probably include me, you know, um, they, they would like line up, uh, sorry, get on their hands and knees uh, in a line and some, another group would get on top and then another group, and they'd see how far they could go. I think there's no limits to how high we can go when God is doing that, when he is arranging us where he wants to arrange us and building us on, building each of us on top of another. And it doesn't matter, you know, when you think about the person at the top, everyone look, wow, look how high they are. That's amazing. They're amazing. But without each and every single person under that structure, that person at the top can't even do what they're supposed to be doing. People should be really looking at the foundation. Look at how the, look at these lot holding the whole thing up. They're amazing. When I think about foundations, Jesus Christ is our foundation. He is, he's a, he is the cornerstone, it says here. He's, he's the chief cornerstone. So in our spiritual foundation, it doesn't matter how we're going to be built or how he's going to build his temple, he is the cornerstone. That's why we guess we remember him at communion. We should remember him at all times, by the way. He, he, we, we live for him. But then I was thinking about these buildings that have um, commemorative plaques on them or, or on the foundation stone. This stone was laid by, you know, and it puts someone fancy's name there, you know, the mayor or such and such. Well, our cornerstone, the one that our church is to be built from, 
is Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. That's, that's our referencing point. That's our starting point. I was going on to say about foundations. He is the, he is the foundation. So any, he, is the, he is the firm foundation. He's like the rock, the rock we build our lives on. But then there are also other foundations, and they were built by the apostles and prophets, if you would read that. But what's amazing about us all being joined together and building up and, 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 um, and becoming who we're supposed to be, like I said, you see the person at the top of that pyramid structure and you think, wow, they're amazing, but everyone should be thankful for those at the bottom that are supporting it. It doesn't matter if your role is in the background, you're still important. So I, I read an article the other day about some guy who, who walked into a, a, he had a, he'd had a, his own church building built. And he walked into it and he was looking around and like, wow, look at the banners, look at the, the, the decorating, look at, you know, he's looking at everything, that, look at what makes, this is not a temple by the way, but you understand what I mean, look at what makes this place amazing. And then someone said to him, yeah, it took us about two years to get the foundation ready and it was under carpet. And you walk into a building, you never look at the foundation, do you? You always go, wow, what an amazing building. This isn't the foundation, by the way. But if it wasn't, if it didn't have a decent foundation, if it wasn't referenced properly to the cornerstone, everything would be off kilter, everything would be insecure. Without the foundation, that building is never going to have those beautiful things in that it needs. Now, I think everyone's beautiful. I think that, you know, foundations can be beautiful. Foundation layers can be beautiful. People who can't be seen can be beautiful. How do I know that? You think of a master craftsman. He's going off my message a little bit, but uh, you think of a master, a master craftsman. Paul Sedgwick, no, master craftsman. <laughs> bit of plug in there. Master, a master craftsman, and let's say they've laid a foundation and they've dug and dug and dug and then they've done whatever they do to build a foundation, uh, you know, put some blocks around it and then poured concrete in. Then they're going to smooth over that concrete, aren't they? So it's like perfect. And they're so proud of their work. They're like, we're all looking at how amazing the building is. And they're looking at that saying, wow, that is amazing skimming. Look how flat that concrete is. Look how amazingly that's been done. Look at how, how many man hours went into digging. Even if you can't be seen, your work is still beautiful. Your work is still important for the whole temple to be fitly joined together and built for Jesus Christ. Amen? You don't need to turn to this, but it's amazing what God has done because you want to make a reference, you can look at it. In, in Mark chapter 14, verse 58, when they were arguing about Jesus and trying to... Um, trying to get him in trouble or find reasons to, to execute him or to get him punished. You know, they were saying, oh, he said he's going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days without hands. Like, they couldn't get their heads around it. It made no sense to them. I can imagine them reasoning now. Now, I'm not saying they falsely accused him. He actually did that. That's exactly what he did. But why it was falsely accusing him and tricking him is because they had no idea how he was going to do it. They thought he's going to knock down the physical temple. He's going to go with hammers and all that and knock down the temple that they already had. And then he's going to somehow build a new temple. They couldn't understand what his amazing... Uh, gift or amazing idea was yet we have the privilege to look into that amazing idea to see that it really is true in three days he did destroy the old temple as in that's not where God's going to dwell anymore in three days when he was resurrected hallelujah which I'm so glad everyone got excited about when we sang in three days when he was resurrected then the temple became people that he moved inside them no wonder as well he said to his disciples I'm going to go and prepare a place for you now, okay, let's not get too deep into all this because some would argue that that is a place in the future. That could be true, absolutely. It could be God can be multifaceted, but also consider it like this. He's going to go and pe prepare a place for them. Yes, he did. That place is the temple of God. Guess what? He's also prepared a place for each and every single one of us in this room to be parts of that temple of God. That is amazing. I don't know how that couldn't excite someone. This is real. This isn't even like just a nice theory or a nice message. This is, this is wake-up time. This is the reality of what God is calling us to. That we're a temple of the living God. 
And it's time for us to be built up. And it's time for people to see who he is by this temple functioning like it should do as a place of worship. And I don't mean the Emmanuel Christian Centre building. I mean us collectively fitted together, allowing the Holy Spirit to dwell and do what he wants to do. Now, there's so many areas and ways to go in this. I am going to get through them all today. Hence, probably a series. Here's the word probably. <laughs> That's, that's partly why, and again, you don't need to turn, this, turn to this unless you want to reference it yourself, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, 2 Timothy 4.2, it's a commission that I often say that I've been given or I feel I've been given, and part of that commission is to tell people ways in which their lives are wrong. Now, I take that commission quite seriously, even though I don't find it totally comfortable all the time. It's amazing when I do tell people ways in which their lives are wrong, they look at me like I've done something wrong. That is what I'm supposed to do. That is part of my role. Now, why am I doing that? To tell you ways in which your lives are wrong just for the fun of it? Like, that's just my job? No, there's a reason behind that. The reason behind it is that you're supposed to be a temple of the living God. That God dwells in you. Therefore, we've got to, we've got to confront sin. We've got to deal with things that shouldn't be there. And yes, the Holy Spirit is, is still there with us. He's still with us at all times. He's still working to sanctify us. But that doesn't give us any excuse to say, oh, well, I won't try and clean my temple up. You should be purifying your temple or allowing the Holy Spirit to clean it up, you should be staying away from anything that would defile the temple of God. To think that God's house is sacred and we're called to be part of God's house. A habitation for the Almighty, I wrote here. A habitation for the Almighty. Isn't that amazing? Where's God going to live? Where's, he's like bigger than the universe. He created it all. Where's he going to live? You know what? blows my mind if you understand that term that God is so big and massive and mighty yet he became so small to live in us that he chose that he chose he, yes he fills the universe but he specifically chose us, us to be a place of worship to be a sanctuary to be a holy place the whole of the universe is is full of his presence but the angels are watching the church. Why? Because they want to see God glorified and honoured and worshipped. And he's worshipped in the hearts of men and women like you and I. That is amazing. So what sort of lives should we live? Knowing that this is a place, a dwelling place for God. That this is a place where he is to be worshipped and honoured and revered. Where he wants to dwell. It's one of the reasons that I, I don't like disunity. And it's particularly a thing that, that I do go after. And I think that heart is from God. I cannot abide it, if you understand what I mean. Someone who causes disunity. In fact, God said he hates it. He hates, any, he hates one who causes discord among brethren. Why is that? Why is that part of the Lord's heart? Because why would God want someone to cause disunity into the temple that he is building. That this is his holy place. It's his dwelling place. It's not about us, it's all about him. And anyone that would come against that to, 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 to mess that up, to mess the fellowship and the, the unity and the, and the connection we have with Jesus Christ needs to be very careful because it's God's church you're messing with. That's part of why we've added to the vision recently. Well, last year, we added to our church vision that we want to be a church of unity and Christian fellowship built upon the love of Jesus Christ. We want to be a church of unity and Christian fellowship because it's all about him. It's about who he is. It's about what he's done and what he wants to do in us. It's all about him having his way in his temple. Temple made up of people. Amen. Turn me to, uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. I'm, going to I'm just going to read through from verse 11. It says, O, Corinth o Emmanuel Emmanuelinians, O Emmanuel, no, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, 
but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. In other words, open your hearts, listen to what I'm about to say. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial or the devil? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Wow. That he would be a father to us, that we could be the sons and daughters of the living God. No wonder, he said, or in, in uh, John it says, as many as received him, he gave the power, the right to be children of God. By his spirit, that is. He's given us the right to be children of God. He's given us a right to be people who can worship him and know him and, and for him to dwell in. What, what other father would we want apart from the father who is the almighty? A loving father, a good, good father. A God who wants to dwell with us and walk with us. A God who said, I'll be their God and they shall be my people. You know what's interesting? That this is a letter to the Corinthians. So if people say to you, well, yeah, but that applies to the Jews. Paul's mission was to the Gentiles. And we're reading a letter that was sent to Gentiles. Therefore, that gives us the opportunity to be with God, to dwell with God, or more importantly, for God to dwell in us, that he wants to, us to be part of his church. I think that's amazing. And that's why we've got to be careful of unholy agreements, unholy alliances, things that, that should not be part of, uh, of someone who, who serves the Lord. We need to stay away from unclean things. We need to be right before him, recognizing who we are, what, what we represent, who in fact lives in us. We want to be careful of alliances where, you, where, where your alliances are around non-Christian things, certainly alliances that are around evil things. You want to be careful about where you're making all your connections. When God says, or when the scripture says, um, come out from among them, that doesn't mean now we all go to a convent or we all go to some kind of monastery and we all stay away from people and dodge them. No, we're in the world, but not of it. And that's literally what this is saying. You might be in the world, but don't be of it. Don't be connected to it. Don't be part of what they're doing. Don't be united with their evil deeds and their practices. You know, like we are united around Jesus Christ. We're not ranked in roles of what football team you support. We're not ranked in, in roles of what you watched on TV last night. But you know, that, like th them things are irrelevant. What unites us is him and who he is. What unites us is the spirit of God living in us. That's the real thing that matters. That's the important part. So when we make your, your connections and, and agreements with other people and alliances, God takes that seriously. Then a lot of the scriptures that the Lord was showing me last year, where it says, if someone do, does this, put them out. Have nothing to do with this type of person. Have nothing to do with that type of person. There, there are clearly scriptures that say that. Now it makes more sense, as God adds light on top of what he already showed me, because I see now he means it because it's his temple. What has his temple got to do with idols? What has his temple got to do with the rubbish and evil of the world? With the temple of the living God, come out from among them. Let's stand together for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we live our lives, but still don't, don't connect. Don't like connect, you know, stand. talk to people. I'm just, be careful what you hear. I'm talking about you and your conduct, your fellowship with people. What is it based around? That's what I'm talking about. It should be about Jesus Christ, amen? Because you're not even your own. You're a temple of the living God. I made a cross-reference here, and I hope it match, I hope it's right. Uh, if you want, you keep in 2 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. 
Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's talking about, well, it's talking about sexual immorality, basically, and the things that people do that they shouldn't be doing, and uh, a lot of evil things, food and all sorts of evil things, and cheats and swindlers and drunkards. Uh, I hope this doesn't describe any of you, slanderers, extortioners, and robbers. It says, it, it says, it says that it will have no share in the kingdom of God. Then if we look further on in verse 19, it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You think, wow, yeah, my spirit belongs to God, but I can do what I want with my body. That's not what that scripture says. That says you were bought with a price. That says not just certain parts you were bought with a price, your body and spirit were bought with a price. That means that every single part of you belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. That every single part of you has a work or a place in his temple. That the price that Jesus paid was enough. And any one of us that tries to take the temple and say, well, I don't want this to be a temple of the living God, are playing a very dangerous game. We're called to represent him. We want to stay away from wrong alliances, evil alliances. We want to stay away from the things that are sinful. We want to be clean and pure, a holy place for the living God. Amen? He's taken our spirits that were once dead in trespasses and sin. We sang that. And he's raised us to a new life in him. Created us to be a marvellous temple of the living God. That is awesome. Our God is awesome. I mean, some of you might be pleased that I'm turning pages. That means, look, he's getting through it. Hopefully you are hearing what the Lord is saying. Because this message is coming from him. Now, I'm not saying that I might not be delivering it perfectly, but I'm saying the message that he is trying to get over is coming from him. He wants to do something with every single one of us, and he wants us to understand our place as a temple. It literally is something he wants us to know for right now, this time, this season, and there's a purpose for it. So I hope you can hear him stirring in your heart to be part of his living temple. Amen? That's why when we meet together in our Christian fellowship, the conversation really should always come back to him, shouldn't it? Because we're here today as people, but the real reason we're here is a collective temple. Temples connect connected together as the living temple of God. Most people will know if you come to my house, I sometimes say I'm a bit boring, but I don't really think I'm boring. I just love Jesus. I'll always try and bring the conversation back to something about God, what he's doing, who he is, where he is. And that is the most important thing in my life. So we as Christians, being a temple of the living God, when we connect, when we fellowship, when we meet one another, what should be the issues that come up? What should be the, the, the thing that comes out of the temple? It should be things about the one who dwells there. Amen? It, yes, it's important sometimes. It, I'm not saying that we ignore people or don't ask and inquire about their lives. But at some point, our fellowship has always got to come back to the one that lives within us. Amen? Everything's meaningless compared to him, who he is, and knowing him. It links definitely to what Dave Smith and Keith Jenkins shared recently about being vessels of honour. If we're called to be the temple, and that was in 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, you don't need to turn to that. But they talked about anyone who cleanses themselves from certain things, and it gives a list of certain things uh, that are not right. It says that anyone who cleanses themselves from those things will be a vessel of honour, fit for any good work, a vessel of honour. Wouldn't you want to be a vessel of honour in the house of the Lord? Wouldn't you want to be a vessel of honour in his temple? If you're called to be a temple, you want to be an honourable one, don't you? I've been to India and I've seen all kinds of temples there. Some magnificent, well, I don't know magnificent. They all, none of them look magnificent, but, um, but like some are greater than others. If you want to be a temple for God and you knew who he was, you might be small, but you, you, know, you might feel small in spiritual stature. But if you understood who he was, you'd be like, I want to shine for him. I want my temple to shine. I want this to be the greatest temple. Not because you're talking about you, but because you want the one who dwells within to be known and worshipped and seen and praised and glorified. Again, no wonder that we're told to um, 
do good works, or the works he's called us to, that our God would be glorified, to be seen of men in some ways. Not for our own pat on the back, but for his name's sake. So yeah, we're called to be vessels of honour, cleaning yourself up. Remember that big picture of a house that Dave Smith showed on the, on, did he show it on the screen? No, I added it to the screen. Yeah, I added it to the video. Uh, he talked about when he was dating Lisa and he tricked her into thinking that he lived in a big house and, and he drove her, you know, he did actually, it's not true, that's actually true, he did live in a big house, but he didn't own it. She thought she was quids in and she's had to suffer that for the rest of her life, that deception. Um, I don't know if that's all true, but it's something like that. Um, but like you, that big house, and Dave said that in that house there was like you know great things, and the, like there was silver and um, uh, fine china, and on the best occasions they come out. There's also like Tupperware and plastic and things you just ram in the cupboard and shove in the cupboard. Well, wouldn't you want to be something that God gets out when it's time to show Himself off? When God wants to bring out his best china, his best silver, he's like, I want to show the world who I am. Wouldn't it be great if he brought you out to do that, saying, here's some of my best china, here's some of my... And I don't want you to hear that negatively, like, well, I bet I'm just plastic, I bet I'm just Tupperware, if anyone knows what Tupperware is. You're not just plastic. If you would cleanse yourself of the latter or the evil things, God says you will be a vessel, honourable, or a vessel of honour. Let's be vessels of honour, amen, in the temple of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to read it through. Um, just, just try and listen to the Lord as I'm sharing. Actually, I'll start from verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? but ministers from whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each, and each one will receive his own reward, according to his own labour. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another, and, another is, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed on how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. God's temple is holy, and there are people in our lives that God has called to help, to lay foundations. The Apostle Paul indeed laid a foundation for us. Jesus Christ is the solid foundation. And I said earlier that no other foundation can be laid other than Jesus Christ. So any teaching, any doctrine, as far as our temples are going, as far as our temples are going to be built, if you understand the picture, as far as our temples are going to be built, there can be no other foundation in your temple than the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, whoever is wise would build their house on the rock, the rock being his teaching, his commandments. That's the, that's the foundation. But whoever is foolish will build their house on sand or the temple on sand, if we're going to use that word. The temple on sand. And when the floods come, that house is going to fall down. So what we're doing in our lives as people who are, who are called to be the temple of God individually and collectively is that we're building on the foundation that can, that's always going to be Jesus Christ. Now there's some good things about that. One of them is that that's a great foundation, isn't it? that if the building started to go rocky because we started to move something, 
and the building comes down. I understand that, but the foundation is never going to be destroyed. The foundation, the rock, the real foundation is Jesus Christ. There's great security that comes from that when we know that he's building us up to be a temple of the living God, individually and collectively. But it's also important to recognise that he says in verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Then it says, if anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, and he also talks, then goes on to say, do you not know? Do you not know that you're the temples of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? Well, you can all answer to that now. Yes, we know. Yes, we know. We know we are the temple of God. We know the spirit is, is, should be dwelling within us. He should be. If not, then seek him. Ask him. Because Jesus said, if you would seek him and ask him, how much more would the Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? Also, if you obey, in Acts, uh, Acts chapter 2, I think it says that God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey. There are ways to get the Holy Spirit. If you are sincere, seek him to be baptized, to be filled. Give your life to Jesus. Surrender to him. Allow him to take over and say, Lord, I want this place to be a temple for you. Dwell in me. Take over. Become resident. If you would believe and trust him, his spirit would fill you. And then, anyway, the point I was making was that we're called to be temples of the living God. And it says here, if anyone's work is, is, is burnt up, well, it talks about different materials here, about the, the, the foundation is Jesus Christ, but you've got to be careful how you build. You've got to be careful. You know, in verse, at the end of verse 9, it says, each one take heed how he builds on it on the foundation that was laid before us. Now, why should each one take, uh, be, sorry, take care, be careful about the build on it? Because we know the foundation is secure. We know the foundation of Jesus Christ is never gonna move. The foundation that the original apostles and prophets brought to us, that's never gonna change. But we, as we're building our lives and following other teachers and other people, and also, uh, you know, building our own lives as a temple of the living God, we start to build and we start to grow. But how are you building and what are you building with? Because imagine that you're building with like hay and straw and a, it says a fire will test that work. Now you imagine I'm gonna build a temple out of hay and straw. That temple, when the fire comes, is gonna be burned up. That temple is not gonna survive. If I'm gonna build a temple out of stone or a precious stones, gold, silver, precious stones, or something like that. Now we've got a different story. You know why? Because you can go and see ancient temples. Uh, you go to Greece and different countries, Italy, and visit ancient temples that were built with stone, and they're still standing. Now, they might not look as wonderful and as ornate as they did um, back in the day, but all the fire and the stuff that's come and all the years of, uh, uh, of, of what do you call it, um, deterioration, has not taken the stone away. You think about our lives, we want to be building solid for Jesus. We want to be temples that are, that are solid for him. That when the fire actually comes, whatever fire that may be, now, we've used this scripture before to say, you know, that everyone's work will be tested by fire. It's true. But bear with me on this. It could actually be the fires of life, couldn't it? And if it was the fires of life, I'd say, Lord, burn my building down now. I want to see what's left standing. And you think about trials that we go through in life as temples of the living God. I'm a temple of the living God. Look at me. I'm giving him glory. And then a challenge comes up and something happens and you're going through that challenge. And it's like, ah, this is horrible. It's like I'm burning. It's like, a, it's like a horrible time or a trialing time or a difficult time. And then you start to see what gets burnt. Whoa, that didn't last, did it? That, that didn't work, did it? That's not working. But then you also see what does work. The stone, the solid things, the teachings of Jesus that he really said, they're still there. So when your work's going to be tested by fire, it does get tested by fire. And maybe it's going to be tested by a fire to come. But it's set, definitely going to be tested by the fires of life. And if you really wanted to be a a vessel that was going to receive a reward from Jesus, you'd say, test my vessel now. Test my, test my temple now. 
I want to see what parts of this temple are built on solid rock and precious stones, what parts give you glory and what parts need to go. And then God allows the circumstances, the fiery circumstances in your life to show you what gets burnt up. It also says um, that even if anyone's work is burned in verse 15, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. I, I can just imagine it like you're going for, you know, like a whole building gets burned and collapses and there's nothing left of it. And it was a magnificent building before, but there's nothing left because of a, a fire raged through it. And I can just imagine some guy there, like, you know, smoke stains all over his face and like his, his clothes all burnt and, and, and the building's destroyed and he stood there in the middle of it and it's like the building's collapsed, this wonderful building that he had. But he is saved, yet by fire. Look at the mess around him. That's why we have to be careful how we build. We are the temple of the living God. It's not about your ideas. God gave clear instructions on how the temple that Solomon built was to be, to be, uh, to be built. He gave clear instructions about that, clear, um, clear direction of what materials to use. Do you not think the Holy Spirit would know what materials to use in us, what clear directions to give to us on how he wants his temple to be built? He will even more so because he loves us and he wants to be, you to be a pure place for him to dwell and to be worshipped and to be glorified. Amen? So I'm not saying it to scare you, to be burned by fire. I'm not saying it because I want your whole lives to come messy and messed up. I'm saying it because we want to make sure we've got something that's built to last. In verse 14, it says, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he'll receive a reward. Endures. Our life, our temple of the living God needs to be built of materials that are going to endure. Self-promotion, hasty ministry, um, no discipleship, quick, quickly being installed into, into like leadership positions or serving God for financial gain, just wanting to get out of hell card instead of wanting to know him. All those things are not going to endure. The only thing that's going to endure is anything that's built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And we all know that Jesus Christ is actually the Lord. He's the master. He's the one in control. The Holy Spirit was sent to lead us, direct us, show us which way he wants us to go. There is... It's not like we're just guessing through this life. We're supposed to be being directed through this life. Growing up to be the temple of God. Amen. Now look at, look at verse 17. It says, If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. That word defile, it means to morally corrupt and to break down, morally corrupt and break down. We want to be careful about how we build and how we interact, knowing that each and every single person who is filled with the Spirit of Christ is also a temple of the living God. But when you read that, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God, God will destroy him. Doesn't, doesn't that sort of bring you bring into focus your interactions with other people that these aren't just people here is the temple of the living god individual temples and the temple collectively it also shows me and especially for ministers pastors ministers evangelists fivefold any leader in any position anyone who has influence if defile means to morally corrupt or to, or to break it down. No wonder God deals with, with those people in certain positions seriously. Because if they defile the temple of God, God will destroy them. Why? Because his temple is precious to him. Because you are precious to him. His people that he wants to dwell amongst are precious to him. And he's very jealous or serious about his people and his temple. Amen? So think about that in your interactions with one another. Think about 
how you talk to someone else who's a temple of the living God. Try, if you can, going forward. Not just for a week, not just for today. Try, if you can, going forward, to allow it into your spirit that you can see other people as temples of the living God, where he's being worshipped, where he's being loved, where he's being glorified. Amen? Also remember that you are a temple of the living God. Remember how amazing that is. I think it's absolutely wonderful that God hmm, dwells in us or wants to dwell in us. When I first became a believer, that's not true. When I recommitted my life to Jesus like the prodigal son, that's the truth. I asked him, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? But in the midst of that prayer was also that sense of, where do you want me to worship you? And yet he'd already decided, right here, right there, where you are. I didn't come to God in a church meeting as such. He was in a little room on my own. But guess who showed up and moved in? The Holy Spirit. I became a temple of the living God. Now, I didn't look very much like a temple on the outside, and there were some fires I needed to go through to burn some things off, a lot of things off. And there are still things that are a work in progress. But remember, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, this week and for every week going forward, you're a temple of the living God. He dwells in you. Consider where you're taking him, who you're causing him to interact with. Consider how holy he is and how holy he wants you to be. When I, this isn't, this is just a picture, not, not a doctrine. When I think of walking in the spirit, when I was reading this and looking at this, when I think about walking in the spirit, we're called to walk in the spirit. And the spirit's also in us. And I see it like, yeah, God has moved into us and we are a temple. But walking in the Spirit is also like walking in the temple grounds, if you understand what I mean. It's like wherever you go, make sure you're staying in those temple grounds. Don't move out. Don't go off doing your own thing. Don't do evil things. Don't, don't cause him to be upset. In fact, do not grieve the Holy Spirit at all. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed. Sealed. Wow. Sealed. I can't see it. Somewhere on you there's a seal. And I don't mean like a little animal from the sea. And I don't mean like a seal, like an O-ring that seals something. I mean like a stamp, a seal. Like a mark that someone would put at the end of a, an important letter on a certificate, like wax with a stamp on it. Somewhere on you there's a seal. God knows those that are, that are his. Somewhere on you is a seal, sealed by the Holy Spirit. You're a temple of the living God. Show the world you're a temple of the living God. Show the world who lives inside you. And let God be glorified by what you do. Amen? Let's pray. Father, you are an amazing God. And there are so many things you want to show us. But Lord, I am so grateful that you have chosen to dwell in people like us. I am so grateful, Lord, that You've not chosen to dwell in buildings made by hand, but you've chosen to live in people. Lord, I do ask that we would be that church that people would see, the temple that people would see, that is so magnificent, so amazing, that this town would be known for you and who you are because of the temple that you are building. And I thank you, Lord, that temple is built with living stones, which is the people that you've called. Lord, I do ask that you'd remind us of the privilege to walk with you, to walk in your presence, to see each other as temples of the living God. Lord, be worshipped in this heart. Be worshipped in all our hearts. Let people see who you are because of the praise that comes out of the temple. In your name. Amen. That's an amazing picture, isn't it? I just had a, you know, a picture like when you go to a temple and you can hear the noise from the temple. 
and you don't know what's going on in there, but you can hear the noise and you can, you know, you can, you can hear the sounds of it. Maybe some of the people around here, when we play our music really loud, I don't know if they're happy about it, uh, but they can hear our music and they hear God being glorified. Well, if you are a temple of the living God, there should be some sound coming out of you. A sound of praise, a sound of wonder, a sound of worship to the living God. Amen? Be the temple. Be built up. Stay close to him. Amen. Thank you.